So this video is going to hopefully quickly answer a question I'm getting asked more and more often these days. What's the deal with these new loudness unit measurements I'm hearing about? The loudness unit, the LUFS, how does it compare with measurements I'm used to, like DB, FS, or RMS, or the measurements of the TT dynamic range meter, the DR value, which lots of people are used to hearing about these days? Very quickly, the new loudness units were developed by the International Telecommunications Union, the ITU, and the idea was to provide a consistent way of measuring loudness, which is quite a difficult thing to do, and give guidelines specifically for broadcast. And actually, the guidelines that they introduced have now become law in the US. Uh, it's a particularly important for regulating the level of adverts uh, in between programs to stop the adverts blasting out much louder than the programs that come before or after them. It's also been adopted by all the major broadcasters in Europe and it's going to become more and more important as time goes on. So there are other videos that I've done that go into this in much more detail but in this video I'm just going to quickly look at what these measurements are and how they compare to each other. So I'm going to start with a simple example which is pink noise and we're going to first of all look at it in the way that we're used to measuring audio. So here's the pink noise signal and you can see up on the meters here it's peaking at about minus 2.5 dB full scale. dB FS, when you see FS in a, a metering measurement it means full scale, it means the maximum value. So the maximum value on a digital scale is 0 dB FS and everything else is below that. So it goes down to, and there's one over here, minus 96 dB on the main Wavelab meter here. And the other measurement that Wavelab gives us here is the RMS level, which is coming up here at about minus 11.5 dBs. Now, RMS stands for root mean squared. We don't need to go into the mathematics of that. Basically, it means the average signal level. So the peak level, if we zoom in, is following every tiny little detail of level fluctuation in the audio and because it's pink noise it's a very random very complicated waveform so the peak level varies a lot and the peak level is pretty high minus 2.5 it's nearly up to 0 dB but the average level of that signal is much lower it's down at minus 11.5 dB full scale and it's this average level the RMS level that tells us the most about how loud the music sounds peak level tells us almost nothing about the loudness Average level, RMS level, is a much better guide to loudness. The new LUFS level is even better, as we're going to see, but we'll get onto that in a minute. I'm going to provide a link to the audio file for that pink noise if you want to download it yourself and try this in your own audio software with your own loudness metering. One thing to be aware of is that there are two different ways of measuring RMS. One of them is specified by the AES for music, and the correct reading for this piece of pink noise using that system is minus 11.5. Some meters will come out reading that as minus 14.5, 3 dBs lower. It's all to do with how the signal is calibrated, whether you set it up using a square wave or a sine wave. Again, we don't need to get into the details. You just need to know if you put this piece of pink noise into your system and it's reading much lower, your audio software is using the wrong method for measuring that RMS for music and the numbers aren't going to quite add up for you. You need to bear in mind that 3 dB difference. So now let's open up a loudness meter. I'm using the Metaplugs Lcast meter. It's a very easy to use, affordable loudness meter, but you're seeing these meters coming out more and more. You're going to see these kind of meters everywhere in the next year or two. Okay, so let's see how the pink noise reads on the loudness meter. Now the meter actually registers three different readings, which I'll go into in a minute, but for the time being let's just zoom in on this line here, which is one of the nice features of the LCAST meter. And you can see that those three different readings settle after not very much time on a value of huh, minus 11.5, minus 11.3 in fact which is the RMS level of that pink noise and is the same as the reading we got up here on the meters. 
So in this simple case of steady state pink noise, we can see that the LUFS reading is the same as the RMS reading for the audio. And actually, it's as simple as that. To get a rough idea of what the LUFS loudness reading of a piece of music means, you can just think of it as being like the RMS, like the average level of a piece of audio. The same kind of reading you get from the RMS meter in your door or on a VU meter if you use one. In fact, it's more intelligent than the RMS reading. There's a great deal of psychoacoustic research and um, some fairly clever filtering that goes into generating the LUFS value. But if you're just trying to get your head around how to read these new meters and what they're telling you, thinking of it as similar to RMS is a great way to start. And one other nice thing about the way that LU loudness units work is that if you pull your fader down by 1 dB, the LU reading will drop by about 1 dB as well. So if you bear in mind that 1 LU is roughly equivalent to 1 dB, that will probably be helpful too. Now let's take a look at a more realistic, real-world example. Let's just shrink this back down a bit. Let's see how this music reads. Before we go any further, let's just take a look at the three different values that are being displayed on the meter here. The peak level is being shown by this scale here. And you can see that because it's reaching up to 0 minus 0.3 dB, which is the setting on my True Peak Aware limiter when I mastered the song, the loudness, the average level, roughly speaking, the RMS, is much lower. In fact, here we can see that the integrated value, which is the averaged value over time of the LU reading, is at minus 15.5. And as the song gets louder later on, we're going to see that increase. And that is represented by the blue line. If I switch off the other two values temporarily, there you can see the integrated loudness of the track gradually increasing as it plays and the song gets a little bit louder. We'll see what happens to that in a minute. The other values are the momentary loudness, which is a short-term loudness reading. And here you can see the loudness rising and falling as we heard those drum fills, those uh, tom fills in the music. Every time there was a tom fill, the loudness came up and in between it dropped back. So that's much more like watching the RMS meters on a display like this or actually watching a traditional VU meter. Let's just show you that quickly. You can see as the bars here fall, the graph there falls and the meters there drop. And then the final loudness is the short term loudness which is somewhere in between the momentary loudness and the integrated loudness. So one thing you need to be careful with when you're talking about LUFS readings, loudness unit readings, is which are you talking about? Personally, I am very happy if an album that I have mastered has an overall integrated loudness of somewhere around minus 11 or minus 12 LUFS. That's an integrated value. But the short-term loudness, the momentary loudness, at the loudest parts of some of the songs could reach right up to minus nine, minus eight loudness units. So let's just watch how the short term loudness varies as the song progresses. Let's switch the integrated loudness back on. And you can see it climbing behind the short-term loudness. It reacts more slowly because it's taking into account the fact that the song has been quieter earlier on. Over time, the integrated loudness will hone in on the correct value for the song. Um, now you can see that the integrated loudness and the short-term loudness are very similar. We're about to hit a quiet section of the song here, at which point 
the short term loudness will drop and the integrated loudness will probably drop with it you can see it slowly falling to see that that's going to come out somewhere around the minus 11 mark this is a pretty loud song but it has some quiet passages in it if it sustained this much higher level I mean the short term loudness here is up at minus 9 pushing minus 8 if it had stayed at that level throughout then the integrated value would be higher as well um, and in fact it's gradually creeping up as the loud ending of the song plays out. Now the integrated loudness value for a song is very important because this is what's going to be measured when songs are broadcast in future and this is what's going to determine the loudness. So just to give you an idea if I shrink the scale back down here so we can see the whole song and the full range of loudness. The integrated loudness value for that track is minus 10.5 LUFS. The maximum loudness was minus 7 LUFS and the true peak reading was minus 0 0.3 dB full scale. It's labelled true peak because this meter will notice if the level goes above 0 dB full scale, but if it doesn't, the two will give very similar readings. The level determined as the average loudness, plus or minus 1 dB, that everything that's broadcast has to conform to in the US and now in Europe and soon worldwide, is minus 23 which is here where I've set this blue line. The Lcast meter has a nice function of being able to set where you want your threshold for the colour coding to be. And I've chosen to put it at minus 23. That means that this song would be turned down on playback on the radio or on TV by 12.5 dBs. Now if there were a piece of classical music that had an integrated loudness that was quite a bit lower, or a piece of acoustic music from the early 80s, say, when they didn't have the very loud mastering practices that we have these days, that would be lifted up so that the average loudness matched. These variations that we can see in the short-term loudness would stay. The songs would still have the dynamic contrast within themselves, but the overall level of them would be matched. So the actual absolute level on the CD would not be relevant in any way. Which means that if we took a hyper-compressed loudness war victim track, which would have basically all of these curves would be pretty much flat. It would be maxed out for the entire length of the song. It would be turned down to the same level as this one, and because it wouldn't have those dynamic contrasts within it, it wouldn't sound as good on the radio or on TV. And that's why these integrated loudness values are going to become so important in the future. It's important to notice that the peak level tells you almost nothing about the loudness. I mean, in the quiet section there, it did fall down to minus 10 or so, but in the loud sections, it's just maxed out, and that's because I've used a limiter in the mastering to prevent clipping of the audio. When you're mastering at these kind of levels, the peak level really gives you no useful information about loudness, and there's no real way to compare the two. And there is already a move in the industry that these loudness unit standards should be adopted in a modified form for playback on MP3 players, computer audio players, and consumer electronics devices. That's exactly what I was predicting at Dynamic Range Day in 2012, and I'll be very surprised if that doesn't come into play in some shape or form in the near future. If you're interested to see that for yourself, you just need to Google for Loudness Alliance.
Now, some people get quite upset at this idea of regulating the loudness of the music that we listen to, but remember, it's only the playback volume. It's not actually applying any extra processing to the music. And the suggestions that the Music Loudness Alliance are putting forward are very sensible. For example, they are suggesting that the overall loudness of an album be measured, and that be what determine the average level of playback. So any dynamic contrast you have within your album will be maintained. And of course, all of this will be an option. They're arguing that it should be enabled by default, and I agree with that. Most people find it very annoying when the loudness of music varies dramatically when they're listening in iTunes or on an iPod or wherever. But anybody who doesn't like the idea of having their loudness match can always turn it off. This white paper has a couple of graphs in it that illustrate it really nicely. If you look here, you can see the examples of a piece of year 2000 pop, a piece of 80s pop, which has a lower average level and more dynamic range, and, for example, a piece of classical music. That's how they are recorded on CD, and that's the the thing that drove the loudness was the idea that by getting louder like this one on the left, it would sound better in some way than a quieter version. This is how, under the proposals that the Loudness Alliance are putting forward, those files will be played back with similar average loudness, centered around minus 25. The 80s pop will have a wider dynamic range and more scope for dynamic contrast. The classical would have even more, and there's still plenty of headroom. And then dialogue would be down here at the average level as well. And what experiments have shown is that that's how people choose to mix things, given the choice, doing it by ear, the way we were used to do it. So broadly speaking, I'm very much in favour of what the Loudness Alliance are proposing. I think it could mean the end of the Loudness War. It could mean that we can all mix and master our music however we like without needing to feel as though we are somehow compelled to push our music to the very limits of what the technology and the audio file can, can bear to the edge of distortion or beyond. So the last thing I wanted to show you was how these values compare to the readings on the good old TT dynamic range meter. So let's pick a loud section of the song. So we have a dynamic range registered on the meter of about 9 dBs. We have an RMS level of about minus 9. We have an RMS up here of about minus 8.5. We have an LUFS value. Let's just reset the meter. Of minus 9, minus 9.5. Nine so that gives you an idea how those different values compare. So, I hope that's useful. Just to recap, as a rule of thumb, the LUFS, the momentary LUFS value for a piece of music is going to be similar to the RMS level that you're used to. And if your music is peaking at 0 dB full scale, the peak level is reading 0 dB, and it has, for example, a dynamic range of 9 dBs, a DR9 reading, the RMS and the LUFS reading are going to be about minus 9 LU. The true peak loudness of the audio is going to be similar to the dBFS, the dB full scale value that we're used to, unless it's so loud that the level can actually be pushed above zero. And finally, remember the different types of LU reading. There's the integrated value, which gives you the overall loudness, the average loudness over a longer period of time, say a whole song or an entire album. And that's a crucial measurement because it's going to determine the playback volume of your music when it's broadcast and probably when it's played back on MP3 players and computer software in future. And the short-term loudness and the momentary loudness give you more detailed loudness information, more like what you get from a traditional RMS meter. My name's Ian Shepherd. There are several more videos on my website about metering and loudness. Take a look if you're interested. It's productionadvice.co.uk. Hit the like button and share this with other people you think might find it interesting if you found it helpful. And thanks for watching.